Mondays we do the on-ramp. Third Mondays we usually have a deeper conversation about some aspect of social system mapping, something that arises from the on-ramp conversations or just from repeated topics that uh, are sort of floating through the community. On July 20th, we will be talking about, uh, I forgot, so it's, it's, it'll be in the marketing. And then today is the fourth Monday of the month of our cycle and uh, our monthly cycle. And today we're going to talk about the connection import feature, um, which I think has some really cool potential, but it is um, totally untapped as of so far. So, um, and just an announcement, if you haven't heard, uh, if you have any kind of desire to talk about anything related to social system mapping or some app, I am doing office hours now every Tuesday morning from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Central Time and every Thursday uh, evening or late afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Central. So that's an opportunity to just jump in, to just uh, jump on the Zoom call. There's a link in our Slack and um, care if you have the link, you can plug it in now. and um, and, and I'll be there and answer questions, talk about whatever you want. Okay, um, today's agenda, we're going to have, we're just doing the greetings and agenda review. We're going to uh, have some introductions. And I'm thinking there are a few of us today that we won't do it in chat. We'll just do it in person or we'll just each take a minute. Um, and then I'm going to demonstrate the connection import feature. Then we'll have some questions and answers. And then uh, we'll wrap up and close at the top of the hour. But for those of you who haven't been with us, we usually um, have an optional extra half an hour where Tim and I and Kara stick around um, to just, if you just, for open-ended more questions or, you know, something you want to talk to us more about. We're usually here and we will be today. So um, let's have for our, oh, I didn't put the, got my slides in the wrong order. I'm going to stop sharing. And maybe let's just go go around. Um, uh, I'll, I'll sort of model what I'm thinking. No, I don't want to. Sorry, I'm always <laughs> changing my mind in the middle of a meeting about what we're going to do. Jim, will you start and introduce yourself and just say your, your name, your location, uh, gender pronouns if you like, um, uh, a network or networks that you're working with, give it like a minute and a half and um and what you're using like how you're using some app or using social system mapping to support those networks and, and why okay um i'm jim best um i live in berkeley and uh, i prefer he him as my gender pronouns and i also identify as white which is important to me these days to call that out make that race visible so um uh, that was the four hits, right? And um, um, there's a couple different networks that I'm working in. One is the Network Weavers Facebook group. And uh, I have been um, probably going to go back to um, helping organize Saybrook alumni. This is my, the institute that I graduated from. Um, but I'm mostly interested, I'm doing anti-racist education right now, working in white majority groups and wanting to build support networks for uh, basically white people working on their racism. It's not an easy path. And um, people come to it as individuals in all sorts of communities, communities of interest and so forth. Um, and where they've gathered, um, my thought is that by using social system apps, they can become more known to each other um, and then makes it easier for other self-organizing mechanisms, you know, just gatherings and stuff for people with similar, with affinities uh, or similar, similar identities or intentions to get together and support each other in that anti-racist journey. So, it's kind of a select community that I'm focusing on right now, but I think the map um, is a great stimulation for that sort of low level of finding each other, the visual directory aspect of mapping. I think that's enough for now. Thank you. Um, who would like to go next? These are hard introductions, Christine. Yeah, okay. I'll just, I'll just so Phil, would you go next? Or, Dallas, I see Dallas unmuted. 
I'm sorry. Uh, Dallas was, was my volunteer, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, that's okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm Dallas Goodnight. I'm from North Carolina. I'm living in the Triangle area. Um, I identify as he, him. Uh, I'm calling on behalf of the Community Food Strategies, which is part of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. We're a three-way partnership of two universities, our, our two land-grant universities here, and our Department of Agriculture. Um, but Community Food Strategies, um, their tagline is cultivating community through food. So that they, um, so we organize food councils throughout our 100 counties of North Carolina. We're still growing. We, I think we're, there's only um, like 33 food councils across the state. But um, uh, a few years ago, before I started at Community Food Strategies, they had explored some app and um, the Kumu networking um, tool for visual, visual, visualization. And uh, I watched your video this morning, Christine, uh, uh, the, the previous video, and you're right, is they, they made it and then put it in a box. they like, they like, oh, this is cool, and then they haven't used it since. But they want to see how we can effectively use this to build the network and show where the tools are and connections are within the state. Because um, this is the time for change, and so um, we can't just let some tools go to the wayside when you find ways to use them the best. So um, I'm here just to learn. I'm still learning a lot about some app, but I'm very interested in what y'all have to say. So oh, thanks for having thanks. me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Okay, Phil, now is that okay? Go next, sorry. Sure, yeah, Phil Metzler in, in Goshen, Indiana. Um, he, him, and I work mostly through a nonprofit that I kind of helped set up here uh, that's locally focused called the Community Resilience Guild. And so one aspect of that is community asset mapping and just kind of identifying um, opportunities to build kind of connections and relationships among individuals working on different aspects of change in our community. Um, and so I've, I mean, that kind of points me in the direction where stimulates a lot of interest for me in, in some of the tools and some of the, the opportunities for how um, social system mappings can help us kind of see more clearly the, the relationships we're a part of and, and opportunities for collaboration. Uh, those interests probably have far exceeded um, kind of genuine opportunities to apply the mapping and, and kind of build some some active and um, you know impactful for, for impactful maps. Um, the most uh, the deepest I've gotten into. Uh, some app, and which is why I was so interested in this this particular topic today, is create was creating some um, kind of demonstration maps uh, to highlight ways in which social social system mapping might be useful um, in uh, monitoring connectivity, social connectivity uh, in the wake of the of shelter in place orders where people were more isolated, and just trying to demonstrate or illustrate how network maps might be used as tools for different types of leadership to um, assess uh, how connected you know their constituencies might be and so that was creating artificial maps in order to illustrate that which meant having to go into it and manually map out relationships and so uh, this was a feature that i was very interested in imagining what how it could be useful to um, you know not just create those specific maps, but in general, help us even create and imagine new potentials for mapping that we may not have have had opportunities come kind of fall into our laps for yet. Thanks, so. So, Miles, we already asked you a little bit before everybody else jumped on. Would you um, do you mind introducing yourself again? At least some. Uh, well, Miles Alexander. Uh, I'm in Oneida County, Wisconsin. Uh, he, him, um, and uh, I've not done any social network mapping yet. I'm, you know, in the, in the learning, and I'm wondering if you're three steps ahead of me here. Uh, I just signed up for your on-ramp in July, um, and uh, I, I do what is hopefully asset-based community development work uh, with Oneida County Extension. Um, and um, asset mapping um, sorts of things as well. Um, I also um, uh, have the dream of, of 
um, trying to get a sense of what the shared vision is in this county and mapping you know, the shape of that uh, as it may vary across the county. Cool, thank you. Welcome, Miles. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Kara, do you want to just say a couple words about <laughs> your presence? <laughs> sure. I was wondering if you would ask me or not. I just um, have you be sit there. <laughs> no, sorry. My name is Kara, I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. I prefer she, her. Uh, I come to social network mapping by way of Christine. Um, I am an admin assistant or a hipster for hire. Um, and so Christine needed a little bit of help with some of the behind the scenes work to make sure that she can focus on the bigger pictures of developing new aspects of some app and making it function extra fluid. Uh, so that's kind of how I come to mapping. A lot of my mapping knowledge is primarily in just encouraging mapping and others. Uh, so if I'm networking or connecting with people and find that they have a project that they're working on that might some way at using mapping. Uh, I'm still still working on my pitch, but I do try to push it to them so they will check it out. <laughs> cool. cool, thanks. Thank you. Tim, do you want to say anything? Um, Tim, me, <laughs> him, uh, mostly the behind the scenes half of greater than the sum. <laughs> I, do, I do a lot of uh, communal work and uh, data wrangling for people who have big projects that want to they add a bunch of pre-existing data to what they're collecting in some app and uh, that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's jump in. So um, I'm going to give you a little history on this, this uh, feature. This was like the thing that taught me about, you know, how people talk about foundations driving, how, how uh, chain, you know, like, like nonprofits are, you know, sort of always trying to get the money. And so they're always shifting their, their vision to fit what foundations are willing to fund. And so like how the money sort of drives the, you know, there's an alter, there's a high vision, but then the money kind of warps the, the chasing after money kind of warps the vision. And so, of course, I knew all about that and had seen that in other contexts, but this was my, <laughs> this was our experience and how that actually could happen with a piece of software. So it was it was a good learning experience. Um, we had um, so the Bush Foundation had a great relationship with um, the vice president of network something or other, and um, he uh, occasionally had features that they wanted. For, we did uh, some really big projects. They were our first major client. Um, did big projects with them, and they would want some app to function a little differently to work just a little better for their context. And so they would pay for us to make that kind of a change. And Dushan, who is this wonderful guy I had this relationship with, um, is, so this map is like 1,200 people, and we did it every other year. And every other year, we started fresh with another 1,200 people. And Dushan pretty much knew everybody. So <laughs> he would be going through some app for months, like saying how well he knew, like seven, eight, nine hundred. He'd be going through it, and he would just he'd be like, "I'm doing it in the plane. I'm doing it in the, in the waiting room," <laughs> and he'd get sick of it. And so he was like, "I want to have, I want to be able to take my connections from last year and move them into this year, so that I don't have to redo it all over again." And I was like, "Oh my God, he has that is such a headache. It was such a headache, but he wanted it." He was willing to pay for it. It didn't, I mean, he ended up paying for probably a fifth of what it actually cost us because none of us had a concept of how technically complex it was going to be to actually do it. And it, it nearly, it was like the first thing that our new developer worked on and it nearly killed all of us. Just the constant testing and the, you know, just the whole thing was, was really exhausting. And, um, and I had a talk with Dushan after and I said, okay, we can't do that again. Like, like I have to be like, I, like it just, you know, you know, this thing that happens, it happened and let's not do that again. But Tim the whole time was like, oh, this is going to be useful someday. I know this is going to be useful someday. People are going to like it. And I was like, I know they are. I just didn't want to do it this year. <laughs> but, but so now I feel like we're to the point where it will be useful. Um, I hope it will. Um, and so, that was just my little snarky story about that. But the point of it was that um, if you have two projects and you have overlapping members in the, in the two projects within the same account, so this doesn't go from 
like Jim's accounts to Phil's account, he, you know, like Jim's network can't cross over into Phil's account. I mean, we could move them into a shared account, but that's enough. Not yet. Yeah, right. Not yet. Eventually. Um, but um, so if you- I never have, thought of that. That actually has a lot of possibility for the future. I've been thinking about that. <laughs> as I was preparing this weekend, yeah. as I was preparing this, I was like, okay, now yeah. what if we like, hmm. Yeah, that'd be something for like gathering network of networks, man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like if we could just have people flip a switch and say yes. Well, anyway, there's so many levels of permission and there's so many levels of yeah. of security that that are involved in this sort of thing that it's it's nightmares to think how to automate it. But anyway, if you've got a project with overlapping members and they have connections in this project, say Tim and I are in a lot of projects together and um we have a you know always the strongest connection you can have and if 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 you've got a lot of people in that position you can just move their their relationships from this project to that project i'll walk through how to do that this phil i suspect isn't what like doesn't i th i suspect that you wanted to load connections like as in pre-existing data so you could just fill them out on a spreadsheet yeah we got to do that one of these days that's an important <laughs> okay, yeah, that was kind of the conception I had for it, but this makes sense. What I'm, I'm hearing the distinction with how you're describing this now. Yeah, so um, that is that is a thing that we know would be great. Um, my feeling is we it would be it would be good f uh, as a start for um, other people to start using this feature. I think I've used it three times, and I think I have saved. Dushan maybe 15 minutes of his life <laughs> in moving connections from that because there weren't that many overlapping people anyway and he still had to do almost as many as he would have um, from the one map to the other and a couple other people have had you know a handful of connections go from map to map so it's like a, a, a nice theory and it seems really cool but in practicality it has not paid off at all yet so my hope is that um, uh, more people will start to use it, especially in the network of networks thing. So I'm going to quit yammering. Um, and so here's uh, a test, a test account of mine. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do is um, yesterday I loaded, I took these 28 people. I added a bunch of more fake email people. Um, and so I have a, a population of 153 people so that I can okay. show you. Question? No, we're not seeing your screen if oh. that's what you want to see. I do that, like I spend so much time talking to people on the screen and looking at my screen that I forget that, that I haven't done that yet. So I apologize. Okay, so um, here I've got, I think nine or 10 projects. We're gonna look at these three import test projects. They have, um, I added 153 uh, fake people to import test one. And then I split that into two populations. So the first half alphabetically is in import test two and the second half alphabetically is in import test three. You don't really, that's not, I'm just sort of kind of giving you a sense that there's one project with all the, all the members and then two separate projects. Um, I'm gonna start with import test three and I'm just gonna go into um, three different, and I'm gonna start with the A's or the Top, bottom of the top of the alphabet and I'm just going to make some connections for these people let's go to each person's space now miles um, and um, Dallas I know you're not super familiar with some apps so some of this might um, m not uh, mean anything to you so without, like, I don't want to get into too much detail about what you're looking at, but if you have a fundamental question that you need to ask in order to even understand what's going on, feel free to stop us. Um, but so this is one person. So this is Alphonse some app instance, and we're just going to, I'm going to um, sort them alphabetically in the opposite order. I'm just doing this so that I can, we can kind of know what to anticipate. Um, thanks, Dallas. Um, okay, so for this one, for Alphonse, I'm just going to make three connections that are all the same, the, just the, the, the lowest level connection. For Ariel, again, I'm going to um, 
just use the same population, but I'm going to start with acquaintance, generative interaction, and then collaborator. And then I wasn't thinking this through. I just realized it doesn't matter. Um, okay. So now there should be in, if I go back to the project list and I refresh, now we can see that, um, why not? Yeah, so there's 88 people in this project and now we have nine connections have been made from this project. Um, I'm gonna see if I can, I just realized that I hadn't thought out who was in which. Yeah, that should work. Okay, so I'm gonna go now to the import connections. If you go to the drop down, it's right here. And when you get to import connections, and know that this feature is really slow because there's all this cross reference searching going on and matching and then sub matching. And so it, it's, a, it's a slow feature. You don't have to do it that often. So, but it is what it is. Okay, so we're in import connections. I'm gonna define a new connection import. Now, um, oh no, I'm doing this wrong, sorry. I don't use it that often either, so. Okay, so they're in here. And what I wanna do is I wanna pull those connections from import test three into import test one, okay? Where they don't exist yet. So I'm gonna go into import connections. And as I go into, now, if you have to do this repeatedly, like with the Bush Foundation, I sometimes had to, like I'd, I'd run the import once and then as more data came in, I'd run it again. And so what I'm gonna do next, you have to think through mapping type to type. And so I didn't wanna to have to do that over and over so we can save a mapping set, but we don't have a mapping set saved yet, which you'll understand in a minute. So I'm gonna define a new connection import here. So I click that and then it gives me this drop down only gives me a list of projects that already have connections in them. So if there's no connections like import test two has no connections and so you see it's not listed here. But I want to import the, the import test or the, the connections from import test three. So I select that I go to import. And now here's the thing that um, uh, you wouldn't you would just think okay there's connections over here we want them over there easy peasy but in fact if they're defined differently in each project, then what do you do with that? So often they're relatively similar. So, you know, aware of their work might mean I know of them, or, you know, like there might be a, a corresponding question <clears throat> um, for each of these and there might not. So what we do is we make it so you have to kind of go through and say, okay, oh, it looks like we've got the same questions. That's great. So we can just go to, map them right over. So you said I'm matching aware of their work to aware of their work here, and then I'm matching that one to that one, and then this one to this one, and then the last one to collaborator. So that's nice and clean. It's really easy. If I want to do this again, uh, if I don't want to have to go through that little step of mapping them or have to remember how I map them, I can just um, save it. Each saved import has to have a separate name so you can't say test and then test again it won't allow you so um, I'm gonna say um, this was um, test three two I can't remember if it's test one parallel I usually make some kind of word that says like what I did with the actual mapping doesn't matter you can make it up but something that's meaningful to you so you'll get it you'll recognize it next time Okay, so now it, I saved it and it ran its little search and it says, okay, there are these three people who correspond to those three people. Each of them has three connections. I can say, oh, I want those ones or I don't want those ones. Um, Cause the president of Bush didn't always want to get moved from this map to the other map. So we make it so that we can uncheck someone. And now I'm gonna import them and it says some stuff. And there we have it. So now we, these are the three that 
Alphonse connected to. And if you remember, Alphonse had all type one connections and then Ariel Carey had a sequence of connections and then Crumry Sarah had a all four connections. Okay, so that's, that's your basic fundamental connections thing. And then here's the history so that if you need to look at what changed when, if suddenly you feel like you maybe made a mistake, you can go into the history and you can find the mistake and you can delete them. So I'm gonna go now and make it a little more complicated for just for the fun of it. Does anybody have any questions right here? And this is the fundamental basic, how it works. Just pulls them over and relabels them if necessary. Questions? No. Um. This is in what which tier products? Four. Is connection history in all products? I think I think I can't remember. Okay, I just never paid any attention to that. Thanks. Um, it, it, it's probably not in the lower tiers. It might be in all pro, all tier four projects. The reason we put the connection history in was just for that reason, because if you're importing other people's connections you want to be double check and make sure you didn't i mean like you just might need to do some cross-referencing and so we need to be able to look at them to see what had happened um but it 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 was never something that we needed in any other case okay so um now let's do this i'm going to go into the um two the um test two names and i'm going to start at the back end and pick three people. And go to their connection panel. And sort them by name just so that I have a oh, let me sort them the other way. Okay, so now I'm gonna open this up and, oh, these are the same. I thought I made some that weren't the same. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, um, well, maybe I'll just, so I'm gonna go back to the, I'm sorry guys. It was one of those weekends where I didn't have a whole lot of prep energy. Um, so, I'm just going to sort of talk through it rather than try and uh, I'm just going to explain it rather than show it. But um, so what happens if, if we're in the um, in that mapping place um, where we're mapping the contact from one contact to another? Um, oh, let's do it this way. I know. Now I remember this. Um, I'm going to import from persons 1A, which is a different project, but it does have some overlapping people. And um, I think it has a different. So here, <clears throat> the options are know of, info exchange, see regularly, and collaborating with. So we have to kind of go through here and say, know of, can we say that's aware of their work? This is a judgment call that you're going to have to make if you're doing this. And and so the what we did with Bush it was it was simple because they just used the exact same survey in the exact same set of connections no matter what project we were doing and so it was easy for me to move them around but where we start to have slight differences conceptual differences then I have to make a judgment call of you know should I map that or should I call that none I could call that none um, and then uh, another way this might be is info exchange and see regularly, I might call those both acquaintance. I mean, I might, I can, I can select whichever of, you know, as many of, re, I can repeat them. Like, let's say there's two that are conceptually close on the one side and on the other side, there's fewer options and you can kind of clump those two together. You can just put them both into the same option. Um, so this is a place where sort of having a sense of if I'm long-term plan, hoping to do a network of networks kind of thing, I might want to think about how I set up the, we set up the connection questions to make them easily transferable from project to project. 
Um, another thing that this can be really useful for is, so for instance, Jim, you're aware of Lisa Nagstead, and we had, um, when we started her project, they had six or seven connection options, and they were sort of broke them down in this fine-tuned way that um, they felt really strongly about. Um, I had a sense when they did it that, that, that it, was, it was too fine-tuned and it was going to make the data not super meaningful. But um, they felt strongly about that, and I usually just say it once, and then and then go with what they say, and and figure well now they'll, they'll learn it, and they'll make make a decision about it, which they did. So the following year, they wanted to uh, shrink that option set down from um, six or seven options to four options. What I did was I exported the whole member list. I didn't export all their data. I did. We just exported what well, we exported everything, and then got rid of everything but the four fields you need to load and loaded that into another project. So we had the exact same population in both projects temporarily. Then I moved, I mapped the connections. So I took like the first one to the first one and then the next two went to number two and then the next like three and four and five went into number three and then six and seven went in. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. I combined, I combined them in my mapping in, in here. So there were seven over here and only four over here. I mean, I set up the second project to have the connections that they wanted. And then I, so I was able to sort of smoosh, smoosh the, the, the responses into a smaller set and put that into the new project and then got rid of the responses in the, in the original project. So lost all the data. Um, rewrote all the, re, re, revised the question options, and then moved the question options back into the original project where all the rest of the data was. So it, it is a little bit of a hack. We also did this, we had a client who put them, put their, put, originally set their project up and put them in the opposite order so that the, the strongest was at the top. And then eventually we could, um, do do this kind of a thing and move them from from top to bottom to bottom you know we could cross each one over so that's a way you can you can use that to kind of fix um those kinds of situations um i was just quick go ahead question is how do you remove the data on the, how did you remove the data on the original project i just um went into the the connection define the connections thing and um, hang on. You just delete the survey. Just delete the connection survey. So if we go to edit connection options, just drag this off and then drag another one on like that and, re and redo it. Does that make sense? So all the data is still in, in your database. It's just not accessible anymore. Well, no, I mean, when I drag this off, I'm deleting all the connection data from the original project. Oh, okay. That's why I have to put it into, so I, I, I imported it into project number two. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah, so that I could get it back again. Other, okay. And, you know, if, if it were just a matter of they wanted to change the wording, but they still wanted to have four options, we could just change the wording, no big deal. But the problem was, we had six or seven, and then we needed to um, combine them. And there's no way to do that here because if you delete one, you're deleting the connected data to it. So um, another couple of things to note is that um, it, if you, so like with the Bush Connect, with Bush projects, sometimes we'd have um, two projects running at once. And so there's data going into two different places and we don't know which one is the updated one. Like, like, let's say, you know, Phil and I just met each other three months ago, and now we're best buddies, um, and we're collaborating. And in one map, it says we have a level one connection. In another map, it says we have a level three connection. We want to make sure that if I'm importing the data from the project where we have a level one connection, it doesn't overwrite our current level three connection in the more current project. So it has to check. So, not, so first it says who's in both projects. So who are the people, the population, the subpopulation, and then what are the connections there? And then 
in the new project, which one is newer? And, and so not overwrite the new one. And so, um, and then you could, if you wanted, import. So let's say we, we go in project A, Phil and I have a level one, and in project B, Phil and I have a level four, and then we move other, other people's connections into this, but we don't overwrite our level four, then we might also wanna go backwards that way and overwrite me and Phil's level four connection in project A and overwrite level one with level four. And some app actually keeps track of all of that. And so if you're going back and forth, it will sort of take care of that for you. But what that means is sometimes you'll see, you know, it looks like there's 20 connections that can be moved, but you'll only get two. And that's because only two of them are newer than the previous, than the 18 that were in the other, the project B, the receiving project. So the counts can be very confusing. I just ignore them. I just say, okay, something's there. I'm, move, I'm moving it. I trust some app to move it, but it isn't because of the complexity of what it's doing. It isn't able to give you account of what's going to happen, what's literally going to happen. It's sort of giving you an account of what's potentially going to happen. And um, so I, I encourage you not to get too attached to the counts if you, if you do this. And then, and then maybe for those who don't know, then the individual can go in and update those connections after they right. move them. And right. make, make sure that they look proper to them or change them if their relationships have changed. Right. So like in that, in that instance with Lisa's project where we went from, seven pro from six or seven connections down to four, then we told the network, we changed the connections, we moved them the way we think is appropriate, but please go in and double check and just confirm that our guess was, was correct. Um, I don't know if anybody actually did change it, but we asked, we notified them that we made this change. And so there could be, you know, depending on how conceptually different the framing of the connections are, they, they might want to move their connection to a different option. Um, other, so that's, I mean, that's, like I said earlier, it, this is the most esoteric feature we have. And um, it, it takes some thinking about how it could be useful um, when you have a situ. I mean, with Dushan's situation, it was really obvious how it was useful to him. Um, in in other kind of contexts, how is it useful overall for your mapping project? I would love to hear <laughs> when, we, when people um, uh, if you use it and how how it ends up being useful or not useful to you. So, questions, Jim. So um, in a situation where uh, you've got, I've lost you guys here, I can't find you. Um, in a situation where you've got a map that's, um, you know, it's been sitting sort of not super active for a while, or you have a major rethink, you have a major rethink about what's, what's uh, about the map itself, and you decide that the categories of relationships that you put in originally just no longer serve. And it's not a matter of reforming the map slightly. It's a matter of rethinking sort of the relationships that you want to map. Um, seems like that might be a good use case that, you know, we started with those four, like the four that you had there and you said like, we've shifted what our intention is and what, what relationships we think are important and yeah, some of those relationships might be interesting of those four, but we really have another, another four that are pretty different here. Um, if you wanted to maintain some of what you had before, but really start in this new direction, it seems like you could build a new map, um, import those connections and be off and running, although you wouldn't have any of the asset information. You, you and what? You wouldn't have any of the uh, any of the uh, human capital, the asset, the survey information. Well, you could you could download that. You can download the survey because right. you're in tier okay. four, and so you could you'd still have to reformat the headers, but you could do that and then upload it. So you you could you could pretty much recreate your project. Um, but um, then you have this whole philosophical question, though, if they're that profoundly different. Like, 
and if there's four and you're just going to go from number one to number one and number two to number two, you could just rewrite them in, in the editor. You wouldn't have to move them if you're, if you're really just going to straight over map them um, in the same order. But even so, does that make sense what I'm just saying? Well, I, I was trying to think of the use case where you weren't straight over mapping them. You were really thinking differently about what relationships you wanted to capture, yeah. where there wasn't much of a mapping. And so... Or and, there was a mix where you have some things that you want, you know, as a baseline, but you have... Yeah. Well, and if they were just ads, you would just add them to the original map. Yeah. And... Well, a thing you could do that just dawned on me as we're talking is like, let's say you had a, a, a list of four or five and you're just totally redoing it and you feel like, and I don't really feel like, you know, number two relates to number two at all. And so I, if like there is no straight over mapping, because if you're saying there is no straight over mapping, then it's like kind of like, well, then you just have to start over because you're, you're mapping, you're going to map them if you're going to move them. But I just thought, well, one thing you could do is you could just sort of say uh, unknown there's a connection, but we don't have a classification for it and put them all in that one. So you at least still have lines. And then what you would ask people is to say, okay, we would love it if you would go in and actually, you know, rank them, put it in a rank again. But, but we've just, we've kept the fact that there's a, a relationship. We've just made it a neutral one, an unranked one. You could do that. And then, you know, over, it would really depend on how engaged your people are with the map if they, you know, if you could get away with, and you'd have to probably nag them for a year. And then at the end of a year, you could say, okay, I'm removing all the unranked connections or something, but yeah. Cool. Other? So maybe it's not as cool as potentially we think it is. <laughs> What I'm saying really useful application for is, I mean, very locally focused work. We're working with different groups, different networks that are going to have a lot of overlap because of the same residents participating in different ones. Uh, but the, this, the orientation of the different maps might be profoundly different. Yet they hold in common that social connectivity as a key dimension that would, could be, you know, designed and, you know, included in each map in the same way. So that's the main thing that you would want to update and keep connected across different maps. The, tell me if this is, if this is kind of a skewed or an unhelpful way for, from your standpoint to think about this, but in dealing with like kind of a large network map where to make it as easy as possible for people to skim through and make and chart the connections, the segment functionality becomes incredibly helpful for people to quickly filter out who am I looking at. So it's like getting that right at the very beginning is really important. And yeah. if I were looking at wanting to include, you know, at present, you know, a lot of different networks or kind of semi-autonomous networks in the same map, then that segment piece might be what I would need to use to kind of draw some boundaries or draw some lines between some of the different groups. In a way, it's like this, you could create different maps within a sumo within your sum app account for the different networks and keep the segment functionality more focused within each map, but use the, the importing of the connection, the social connections across the different maps as a way to kind of help keep that bigger picture intact. I don't know if that's making sense or, or resonating. Yeah. 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 Um. I mean, that's kind of like what it seems like is like, and as we're talking, I'm like sort of thinking maybe that's hopeful and it's not, I mean, <laughs> like it, it, it wouldn't like a thought that I, you know, like, I, I don't know if you've all seen, um, I don't think Dallas has, but um, um, Ben, Ben Roberts's map, that's a, it's not a local map, it's a global map, but it's definitely a network of networks. And then there's other, like, and there are people on that map that are on the June Holly map and that are on, you know, some other, in some other networks that you sort of see, I see, because I, I see a lot of maps, you know, in, they're all over the world, but they, they have overlap in different networks. And so 
part of what I've been trying to think about is how could you have, um, you know, there's, there's June's map, there's Ben's map, there's other maps, but then find the, like the people who overlap them all and make a map, like a, a, like a map of the super connectors amongst the networks and then have different maps in, in Kumu fed from different projects, but have this super connector map that, that, that kind of shows who's in these different networks, something like that, which is a non-local version of what you're saying. I, I still think it, it's, um, it, it, it's a, th it's a it's thing, you know, I would like us to try at some point. I'm not quite sure where to begin. Yes, Jim. Well, what Phil was saying there is stimulating the same thing in my mind, which is in a network of networks. If you're, for some reason, you're able to build in, in a large community local map. So I'm thinking of the liberating structures world where there's a very variety of energy. So this community is like 5,000 people. And there are pockets where people have energy to map and other pockets that would care less. But yeah. you would have these disconnected pockets of 100 people or whatever, a couple hundred people where they're, where they're actively mapping. And at some point, you know, they're, they're all part of a network. of. It's not a network of network. It's a large community, but these, there's these pockets that map. There are times when you'd like to see them in relationship with each other. Um, those people would like to see themselves in relationship with each other. So it seems like this would be a good opportunity. You build a large map and you import those people um, yeah. into that larger network of network maps. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, thank you, Jim. And I mean, for kind of laying it out and where you went with that, Christine, made, was helpful for me too. I mean, it allows you to make, build the micro maps or the small, the, the more focused maps. Yeah with the the segments the surveys the the you know the specific focus that you want to and right. still know that you'll be able to pull them back together into something larger um yeah practical. yeah so another way I, what i'm what, what you just triggered in my mind was the problem where um there's there's always a sort of tension of um like jim you're aware of you know um drew and david in in england who have these four sort of separate networks and they're trying to make a network of the networks but each sub network sort of needs its own survey and its own you know it, it's got its own uh, context and so the tension is always do we make one big one big map with a relatively generic survey or do we do four smaller maps with a much more uh, contextually appropriate survey and that's a that's a place where you it would be great you could do that and then just like you just said and then have one map that is more generic is a generic is like the larger broader map it's not as contextually specific and maybe that one has a, a smaller survey that just has like just a very few demographic questions and you have to go into the smaller maps to see uh, more specific survey responses you always right. I knew it'd be helpful someday. We'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good scenario everyone came up with. I had another question for Phil, but um, I, maybe Dallas and Miles um, want to jump in here. Is Miles still with us? Oh, but maybe Dallas. Does. Miles messaged me that he had it out. It was a little above him, so he's going to join for the armory. That's good. what I was. I, I guess that was what. Yeah. Um, Dallas, did you have something? Um, I've just been listening and I've been actually looking at uh, on my other screen on the Sun app and Kumu map that um, the team's already started and just so like, but again, I'm very new. So what you were showing me was still just like getting more confidence to use it. And so the question I, I'm still asking myself, uh, I mean, I'd be on topic is just uh, how can the general public find this useful? Because right, we have the Kumu map, but then it's like trying to find ways that they can understand it so easily because it can be daunting when you see as much technology and data. So uh, what's like maybe your experiences in getting people to actually use it once you make it? So Dallas, that is the, um, the, the, the sort of the question of the year in the bleeding edge of this whole practice that sort of we're all in a lot of conversation about. 
which is how do we, we call that sense making. So once the map is made, how do we help our community make sense of it and get value out of it? Um, because it's a new tool and it it's a new tool that represents a way of thinking that isn't our standard way of operating or thinking or strategizing. So that's a whole extra layer of uh, discovery and exploration that we're, this these people you're seeing on screen are working in in different contexts and um so you you can be part of that discussion with us and we we'd welcome that um and i and I, and it's not a quick answer there isn't a quick answer it's there are strategies um but it will take longer conversation that's mostly of what the monday meetings do is yeah. to tackle that question in, some, in, in various ways and formats and, you know, yeah Hey, Dallas, I took a stab at this. Um, I just posted in the chat um, a YouTube playlist that uh, a set of small YouTube videos that I did for the NetWeavers Facebook group. And there's one called Why Map. Um, and it's, you know, it was like four different value propositions, re reasons to map. And maybe that's a useful, it's one conception of this, but the very first baseline was around using it as a visual directory. It seems like everybody gets excited about that because they can see themselves and it, all these other people that they can bump into uh, fixed on the map. And they can drill down and say, oh, here's the information they put in the survey about themselves. And here's who they know in this community. And that seems to be like sort of universally uh, attractive to people. So it may be that that's an engagement point where you are really, you're at that level and you're building community by um, seeing community together. Um, but I don't know, it, it's, it's all I got at this point. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll check out that video. Um, this, when I was trying to brainstorm other ways, I, I, did, I was thinking this could be used as a directory, but then I was like, if it's this, if it's this complicated, then why don't we just use a simple list? But you're right, having a visual uh, and having a new way to, to show the, information right um, well, and also if you think that relationships are the foundation of what you're able to do together then I don't think any other directory visualization except seeing those relationships gives you that information so that's what's unique about a social system map in that regard in terms of a directory is not only have you got the information, how to contact them and something about them, the human capital, but you see the social capital. If you think mm -hmm. the way you transfer ideas, innovations, advice, help happens through that network of connections, then here they are. So, um, and just, <clears throat> Del, it's just, I also, I, I just plugged in a thing, the, the, the thing that Phil made, which is, um, I think is, it was a great, um, sort of ex example of how you can sort of build this, sort of a scaffolding around the map that helps people have a, an introduction to it before they get into it. That is, um, you, you know, between the, like Jim's um, videos and Phil's scaffolding, I think there's probably a lot you can pull out of that and a lot of ways to think about how to um, help people enter into it. One thing that seems really clear is this: just plunking a map in front of them isn't isn't is never going to be at least not for many decades. Maybe someday it will be so common to people, but right now, plunking a map in front of them is not enough. Um, and and so that's a really important question that you brought up. And those are two cool pe cool ways that people have taken a stab at dealing with that. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say. Something else I was considering is just that it's um. It, when you just show all of these dots and lines in front of some, somebody, they get scared. And so I was right. thinking about like at our university, our directory is just a, a search bar. You say, I want to find this person or this interest and it pulls them all up. So I was um, wondering like how to make the map to where it looks more inviting, where it maybe it's just the logo of our network. And then say, mm -hmm. what do you want to know? Who do you want to find? And mm -hmm. then um, which I guess that's just, trying to figure out the layers is probably what that would take to make it work, right? Yep. And actually, um, the what you just said, I'm going to give you, I'm just realizing I 
I don't know if we have a quicker, if Kara has a quicker way of getting at this, but I'm going to give you um, in the chat a link to, um, we have a social system mapping community, social system map. Um, and in, in that map, um, we have, since, since the map that you're referring to, um, we have learned a lot about how to set up the views in a way that is, is easier to step into. And so we start with the simplest, least, least scary kind of presentation, and then we sort of march into more complex presentations and we sort of explain what's happening. And my take on it is that most people will never go past the first view or two. Um, but there's an example of that. Uh, the link I just gave you is an op is a is a link that will um, you can opt into our community practice map and be on it, and then you'll be able to access it. And then you can use that to just to learn from as well to use as an example, as well as um, have sort of your own experience of what it's like to 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 go through the whole process as a member and um, help us build this community practice and build this field of what how to. Uh, help people learn from the maps. Yeah, cool. Um, thanks for that link. I'll check that out. Cool. So it's the top of the hour, and I just want to do a time check. Who's is everybody sticking around or jumping off? I want to just be formal and polite and say goodbye if anybody's jumping off right now before we go. I've, I've got to jump off. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to um, jump off too. But this is, it was really great, and so I spent some time looking more into this. Is there someone I can reach out to for questions ever? Or? There, there's a, Kara, will you put the Slack link, um, give her just a minute. Okay, click on that link to the Slack team and we're all in there and um, that's your best source for uh, your starting place of connecting. Nice, awesome. This was, this was so good. Thanks, y'all. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you, Phil. Good to see you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.